This is the story about Nitin Desai who played a leading role in mainstreaming sustainability into economic development policy. This led over two decades to the sustainable development goals articulated and approved by the UN General Assembly. Nitin was born in 1941 in Mumbai to Shanta Ben and Ambu Bhai Desai, a prominent solicitor with roots in rural Gujarat. He grew up in a large joint family, studied at Elphinstone College and later at London School of Economics. He was on the faculty of two British universities and worked briefly in the private sector before joining the Planning Commission in 1973. Nitin married Aditi in 1979 and with their two children lived for many years in Geneva and New York where Aditi also contributed to UN's work with non-governmental organizations. Nitin joined the Brundtland Commission as a senior advisor in 1985 and played a major role in drafting its seminal report, Our Common Future, particularly in the parts evaluating the past and proposing the concept of sustainable development as the basis for environment and development policy. That report marks the beginning of the emergence of the concept of sustainable development in the global political discourse. This is the story of how it started and developed over the years and the role he played in the Brundtland Commission as the Deputy Secretary General of the 1992 Rio Earth Summit on Environment and Development, as the UN Under Secretary General responsible for the follow-up to Rio and for several other development summits, and as the Secretary General of the 2002 Johannesburg World Summit on Sustainable Development. This idea came about that we should perhaps have a conversation and try and understand and tease out the wealth of knowledge and information that resides with you so that people can learn and understand the whole development of India's journey as well as the evolution of a global environmental negotiation movement which involved the UN, which involved uh, scores and later hundreds of com countries their action and how do you get make it more democratic involve civil society process in the whole thing and where and we will finally try and end up on where we stand now and what is the hope for the future do I work uh, as a development economist uh, all my life I still am that uh, how did the idea of integrating environment into development come sort of register how did it develop I can't say it was right there from the beginning, uh, straight away. So I was a little involved when I was teaching in England in the 60s, late 60s, in a few things. Uh, the, when the third London airport was being built, the university that I was studying at, Southampton, was involved in the, if you like, the social cost benefit of that. And that included the environmental element. And in fact, it was led by a person who's a wonderful man, who's no more unfortunately, and who was a colleague of mine in Southampton, David Pierce, who was a very well-known environmental economist. When I came back, I started working on the Twin City project in Bombay. <coughs> now that inevitably uh, involves a certain element of uh, looking at the environmental dimension, because what you're talking of is dense urban development. Now you can't talk meaningfully about dense urban development without worrying about things like where is the water going to come from, what's the uh, environmental impact going to be, what about air quality and things like that. So that already sensitized me. When I came to the commission in 73, I was in the project appraisal division. Uh, it was headed by a man called Lav uh, Lavraj Kumar, who had a very... This is the planning commission. Planning commission. And he had a very strong interest in the environment, particularly from a conservation perspective. And right then, when we have started doing an analysis of public investment projects, one of the dimensions which we always looked at when we had started looking at was environmental impact. For instance, the Mathura refinery is, a, is one example, a famous case yep. because of its potential impact. Taj, impact on the it was also the time when India, following on after the Stockholm Conference of 72, had started doing something on the environmental side. We did not have a ministry, but we had a national committee on environmental planning and coordination. It was headed by a man called Pitambar Pant. Pitambar, it was very interesting, 
that the man who did all our perspective planning, long-term planning in the 50s and 60s, Pitambar Pant, was also the man in charge of uh, the first chair of the National Committee on Environmental Planning and Coordination. So these are early stages. We are still finding our way. We are doing environmental impact assessment, but that sensitized me. This was the beginnings of the EIA. There are people like Ashok Khosla was in the NCEPC, and that uh, uh, made a difference and that developed. So from 73 onwards, this was quite uh, crucial. And do not underestimate Mrs. Gandhi's role. Mrs. Gandhi was the one Prime Minister who we've had who really thought environment was more important than else, anything else. Remember she stopped Silent Valley yeah. and uh, she really had a deep a commitment on yeah, she, she, I think Jairam Ramesh has just written a book on He's just written a book. And remember, I keep reminding people that at the first uh, UN Environment Conference in Stockholm, yes. the only head of government other than the host country who went there was Indira Gandhi. Right. And she made that famous speech about p uh, poverty. Yeah, and, and the Project Tiger was also launched. Project at, Tiger uh, comes in and, and that whole process starts. Mrs. Gandhi's role is very important in bringing India, uh, bringing environment into Indian policy it, thinking. It must have been difficult because 70s were the time of, you know, uh, a lot of nationalism. Banks had just been nationalized. Mm. There was uh, shortages of commodities, of agriculture, uh, food, food grains and, 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 you know, other, other commodities. So in, in that scenario, to try and integrate environment and you know we will we'll come to the genesis of sustainable development but to 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 integrate environmental concerns in these must have been uh, 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 a, a difficult and yes uh, and no uh, we, if we we didn't use words like sustainable development yes but let me give one thought here that because of the sheer importance of agriculture in our country We've always had this focus on, for instance, drought-prone areas program, you know, and things like that. That started much earlier. And that was a very resource management-oriented right. program. In fact, I would argue that in the 60s, the special programs that we had were actually very environment-focused. And it's really later that populism yeah, comes in exactly. and becomes anti-poverty, you know. Yeah. Hill area program, drought-prone area program. All our struggles in trying to cope with nature, to live yeah, with the cycles right. of nature. Absolutely. And then even with the Chipko movement in the 70s. That's right. Those are, again, development issues, but you can also see them as environment Absolutely. issues. Absolutely. So to try and understand the two together is probably beneficial and, uh, you know, none better than people who, who feel it and live with it. Absolutely. To try and understand and integrate that into the thought process. This idea that basically uh, you cannot have a uh, livelihood if you neglect the resource on which livelihood depends is an important idea. The reverse is equally important, that you can't pro you know, uh, uh, protect a resource unless you protect livelihood. That is, both things have to be done together. I can't go and say I will protect this pasture land and forget about the needs of the people who use that pasture land. Equally, if I want those people who live off the, the animals to, to do well, then I'll have to worry about the quality of pasture. So the two they have to go together. This was not always there. Uh, it was because initially our focus was on one thing, the resource. And later our focus shifted to the other thing, the anti-poverty side. Right. I've always felt that one of the weaknesses in our system is we've not successfully connected the two well. It's Indian still there. Our system here in India or? In, in, I would say India, I'm more familiar with, but I would say more generally. And therefore increasingly what I have felt for some time, and we'll come to that a little later, is that the focus in India has to be on sustainable livelihoods, combining conservation with livelihoods. And that is something which, are, we, we, is, is something which is still work in progress. It's not happening on a scale. But to get back to the 70s. So, yes, I think this was happening. And then if you'd go into the early 80s when the sixth plan, plan was done, Dr. Swaminathan and Professor Menon were there in the planning commission as members. And if you look at the text of the sixth five-year plan, I was very involved in the drafting of that because I was at that time 
uh, and a fairly senior advisor in the planning commission. And I would, I, I, besides my work on projects, I was also sort of like a, a, a overall advisor on development. And if you see that, the word sustainable development actually is used there in the 81-85 plan. The word sustainable development is actually used in that plan. Uh, it was not fully spelt out, fleshed out, uh, because our agricultural policy was still remained focused on production badao, production badao, you know. And uh, on the urban side, we have not faced up to the problem at all, nor is there evidence we've done it now, but that's a different story. And uh, the energy issue had started coming in. We started, if you remember, IREDA started in the early 80s. But you know, we didn't start IREDA from an environmental perspective. We started it from a energy access perspective, that there are places where we can't reach energy through the grid. Yeah. So I need uh, uh, renewable energy to d deliver electricity. So we actually started IREDA a long time ago, you know, long before the world was talking renewable, yeah. but not from a very different angle. You know, as a hardcore economist as you with a degree in political science, and then to move to speaking about sustainable development, you, you do mention that you've learned and all these things, but how do you, does this come about? Where does this, uh, how do you convince your peers that this is what's, what's important? Well, I would say that basically in the first phase, in the 70s, when we were doing environmental impact assessment, the issue, well, it was done mainly because we were implementing legislation. There was pollution control legislation, etc. So we were, in a sense, implementing legislation. If somebody from a, a public sector said, my God, this is going to cost us something, we said, you can't, but we will have to do it because the law requires you to do it. So the impact was more from, I don't think we convinced people. Uh, I think uh, the, a lot of the stuff that we did in environmental impact assessment was... Uh, more because of legislative pressure. There are one or two other areas in water resources, for instance. You know, we started uh, uh, looking at it. I'll give you one interesting example. I remember when I was there in the commission, we got a project to build a, pro a dam in the middle of the Mahanadi you know, for holding water back. And uh, in, the, in the government, when you get the proposal, the whole file comes, which is this thick, and it, the notings go back decades. I obviously must have had time on my hands because I read all the notings. And I came across a noting by one, one of the persons who had looked at it, saying that by the, in, this thing will have an adverse impact on the coast of Orissa and affect the Paradi port. So this uh, dam was hundreds of miles from the coast. But if you had held the water back, it would have affected the littoral drift and the coast. Now that was a sort of thinking of looking at environmental impact on a much larger scale than uh, what's being done. Typically, they would only look at it in a very highly localized uh, context. So some of these things started doing And in fact, that project was at that time stopped. Uh, uh, something else happened, a little, which brought me even more deeply into this. When in uh, 78, a National Commission on Backward Areas was set up with uh, Mr. Shivraman as the chair, and I was the member secretary. Now, in the very nature of things, when you talk backward areas, you're talking of, you know, play, we, we, I, I visited the Sundabans with him, for instance. We went to the Northeast, uh, then uh, hill areas, drought areas, all that. You know, forced to get into uh, the, the fact that you cannot talk development without addressing environment. That there is no point in talking about development in a hill area or a drought prone area or in a Sundabans uh, or, or so on, unless you address the resource issue. So that's all these things were building up. I can't say that it had all come together in one concept. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so this happened, 80s, as I said, we got into this, this was being done. I, I got married in 79, Aditi come, uh, enters. Uh, she, of course, came from a sociology side, uh, but uh, she came from a family which had a, how shall I say, a great passion for things of nature and so on. 
uh, which uh, I did not necessarily have. I'm no great gardener or anything. She got a little involved in some training projects on the smokeless chulas. So uh, her involvement has been more at, you know, in terms of ground level work, in terms of she's worked very much at the ground level in terms of working with these women and training them in smokeless chulas and so on. So in a sense, my horizons were widening. But I can't say that it had all come together. And I think it only came together when we faced the challenge of the Brundtland Commission. Right. Uh, you know, that's where it really all, so the influences were there. The sensitivity was there. And in fact, I was called into the Brundtland Commission. So yeah, that's what I was, how, how what was your involvement with the Brundtland Commission? See, when and this, if you can tell us a little bit about, you know, when it was set up and what was its mandate? Yeah, my Brundtland Commission was set up in, uh, I mean, remember now, I think late 83, early 84. And its mandate was called the World Commission on Environment and Development. The origins of this were that after 72, UNEP had been set up, United Nations Environment Program, uh, whose first head was Boris Strong and the next one was Mustafa Tolba. And there was a feeling that it was not delivering. Uh, I personally think that's an incorrect assessment because almost every major environment ministry in the world is a post-Stockholm uh, uh, achievement. So I would say that it's not entirely correct to say it did not have an impact. Yes, its impact was largely environmental. But remember, it was a conference on human environment, not on environment and development. It was aim was not that. Its aim was to say that we need to act so as to protect uh, uh, our environment. Therefore, pollution control and so on and conservation were the two big things uh, which were, were driving it. The, so the, I, I, I would argue that the, it was actually more successful than people said, but people say, thought it was not that effective. So this is why the, <laughs> the Europeans <clears throat> wanted something. So they, they, they set this up. The Japanese were the big supporters you know, uh, of this whole initiative because it was an out of uh, UN initiative. So it had to be funded. They brought together a team and they had a man in charge of the economic side, the head, the senior economic advisor, as he was called, which Vincente Sanchez. Now, Sanchez came from a Latin American uh, economic, uh, radical economics background about, you know, the uh, center periphery relations and things like that. The secretary general of the conference was a Canadian gentleman, Mr. Jim McNeil who was a pollution man. He had headed the Environment Directorate of the OECD, which was basically pollution management. And his, at, uh, you can't imagine a gulf wider than this. Mm. Uh, on the one guy, one guy who sees it largely as a legal jurisdictional issue, and another guy who sees it as a fundamental systemic issue, so there was a complete breakdown. But amongst the commissioners, there was a sense amongst those who came from developing countries, this is a conspiracy to stop us growing. And a lot of the developed country guys had come from a very pure pollution control environment background. An example would be Bill Ruckel's house, who was the head of EPA. So they, they ran into a problem. They said, we have to do something. So the, somebody had the idea, why don't we get a development economist who is open to environmental ideas. So they asked Ashok Khosla, whom they knew, because Ashok had been earlier in UNEP. Ashok Khosla suggested my name to Jim McNeil, and Jim McNeil met me, and he said I'd deliver, so I went there. And that's how it all started. So I can tell you a little bit more about how what happened. This was also the time of uh, the Rome Conference on Limits to Growth. And that was a little earlier. That was earlier. So you know, there was the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome. So there was also this yeah. feeling that this is probably an, an attempt to somehow impose to growth reach, limits. Yeah, growth limits. So, yeah. so limits to growth was there. There was a World Conservation Strategy. Incidentally, the World Conservation Strategy does talk of sustainable development but largely from a conservation perspective. So that's how I got into Brundtland. And when I joined Brundtland, I could see the breakdown. And what, what, what were your interventions in that regard? I would say the beginning, I, there were three commissioners who were asked to explore all this. One was Maurice Strong, 
the other was Sridhar Tramphal, was Secretary General of the Commonwealth, and the third was Janos Stanovnik. And the idea was these were three people who were represented the North, the South, and the East. You know? And they would try and... And uh, I was there I, very soon after I joined, we, I, and I heard them as to... And I could see that the differences were not that huge, that they were bridgeable differences. Yes, they were there. And that's when I started talking about sustainable development and so on. And I drafted that very, by now, a fairly famous note on uh, the concept of sustainable development, which was placed before the Brundtland Commission. Famous definition, which was written in that first note, which I wrote for them. Meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Neither the word environment nor the word development is used. It clearly focuses on the importance of meeting people's needs. But it also clearly focuses attention on intergenerational equity, because you must not compromise the ability of futures. So, in a sense, it was very successful. And its success is that this is the most trotted out definition now, partly because everybody can read what they want into it. When they saw this in Ottawa, they made some small changes, but essentially they bought into the idea. And in many ways, sustainable development is a bridge concept. It was meant to connect two, two, two epistemic communities. You know, one, the guys who are primary concern is growth, development. The other is the uh, people whose primary concern is protecting nature. But what efforts were required in your part to bridge this divide? You know, given that there were such extreme views, and positions, how do you bridge the, This is what I saw. The views were not quite as extreme as that. That a man like Ramphal recognized the importance, but he felt that the way things were being developed, it would be a stop growth. A man like uh, Boris Strong, who was the Secretary General of the uh, 72 Conference, also saw the relevance of development partly because of his own business background, that you can't neglect development and protect environment. And Stanovnik was sort of in the middle. So I could see that there were already a basis for talking if one could demonstrate that the two things can support one another. That I can't protect the environment by denying a livelihood to people. Right. I can't give people a livelihood if I destroy the environment. It, it was a very simple idea and it's so obvious. Yeah. It's so obvious. It's simply a matter of sustainable development is nothing but elaborating this in a larger context where you're not just talking about a farm, but you're also talking about non-renewable resources. You're talking about you know, global risks and all sorts of things. And if you look at that chapter and particularly the longer thing that uh, I, I had put up before them, you will see that all of these issues are there. I've been rereading it after now what? It's more than 30 years since I wrote it. And I must say it still reads very well in the sense that it, it actually has uh, all of the key issues of balancing yeah, uh, in, 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 in written into it in that you see that long chapter uh, there. And that is what worked. And you know, the interesting thing is the change that I saw. By the time we finished the commission, a man like Ruckel's house was an old-fashioned uh, pollution control man, started saying, this can't be done unless the debt problem is resolved. And a man like Ramphal, who thought this was a conspiracy to stop growth, started saying by the time we finished that we cannot get growth unless we start worrying more about the environment. This was the one criticism that the Brundtland report got from the mainstream environmentalists, that you people are too soft on growth. Yeah? This was one of the criticisms which has been there of Brundtland. And uh, that was something which I must say uh, probably came in uh, with some vigor because of me. Because I came from a poor country. And I said, there's no way in my country I can go back and say that you have to give absolute priority to protecting nature and environment. Yeah. Uh, that people are starving and dying. You know? And there's no way I can do that. No, but the, the, the thing is, yes, you need to give it priority, but why do you want to give it priority? To, in order to safeguard Absolute, that resources. And and then you, and but then you can't neglect today's needs also. Right. So uh, 
the, cent the, 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 the key was to say, but then even for today's needs, I should worry about the environment. Right. You know, that I can't take care of today's needs. And I think this is the thing that we have to keep pursuing. Uh, let me take a simple example. Today, we people talk of health in Delhi. Huh? They say, uh, and people will tell you, oh, it's so expensive to have uh, this, uh, uh, take cars up to uh, Euro 6, or it's so expensive to stop diesel. It's so expensive to do that. But more and more, what I see is people say, so what? My health is important. 20 years ago, this argument would not have flown. Today, I hear this argument and people accept this. Yes, that I can't, that, that uh, health is my concern, just as livelihood was in the old days. Okay. And I can't get health unless I also have environmental protection. So don't tell me uh, that uh, you can't afford it because uh, I can't afford the ill health. So in that sense, slowly, what I see is that people are recognizing that this is not something which is against development. It is something which is an integral part of what development should be. Right. Good health is development. So in these negotiations and, 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 and these uh, dialogue. back and forth dialogue that you were engaged in, were you, uh, I'm a little confused, were you uh, uh, an independent consultant that was seconded to the Brunland Commission? Were you the Government of India representative? No, no, I have nothing to do with the Government of India. Absolutely zero. I'm never, none of my international work has had anything to do with the Government of India. I was there recruited as a, as a full-time employee. And I was brought in as what I call a draft animal, you know, to, to pull the cart along. And uh, so I wrote that and that flew. And then later I was asked to look at the overall report also. And in the end phase, there were three of us, me, Lloyd Timberlake was a journalist who wrote the summary, and Linda Stark was a professional editor. We were three were given the responsibility of the final cleaning up of the report. From Brundtland, you then uh, returned to India. From Bruntland, I returned to India. And uh, I think uh, Bruntland's impact was a second thing. Let me just, before we leave Bruntland, the second area of Bruntland which, uh, which struck me and which had a longer term impact on my thinking was uh, that uh, uh, the way in which the hearings were held and the way in which NGOs participated in the hearings. Uh, I remember one of the first ones I went to was Sao Paulo. And in Sao Paulo, uh, they took us to see what they said was a very good place for pollution management. And there was a Brazilian NGO who sat in the bus with us. And while this man from the front of the bus was giving us a lecture on one of the wonderful things we, they were doing, this man from the back of the lecture was shouting out all, why that fellow is wrong and why all this is happening. And I could see now you know, that uh, that this is the that this is the environment is a common interest, a right. public interest. Right. It is not the interest necessarily of those who are powerful. That's certainly not necessarily the interest of those who control the economy. And therefore, it's very important to have the voice of those who do not control the economy, who are not in positions of power, being heard. Right. At the importance of the, and, and the NGO in environment is. It in the very nature of things, the environmental concern is a mass concern which concerns everybody and will never be the priority concern of those whose primary job is to make money. You know? So this is why, I, so that, that was a broader thing which impact, which I saw. Right. He, uh, I had not experienced this. We didn't have that experience in India you know, of NGO. Yeah. You know, it was our thing is very bureaucratic and yeah. You know, you meet other government Very officers, top down, uh, top down, but we don't have, we didn't have a system of, we had consultation. We, uh, we, we, we met with experts, yes, you but know, not. I, I wanted to say that yeah. uh, when I got married to him, he was the first government servant I knew. I used to go in demonstrations against the government uh, for many issues, you know. Uh, basically, there were social, political, uh, these kinds of issues uh, of the time. And whatever was wrong, I used to say, he used to say, I'm not the Sarkar, I'm not Bharat uh, Sarkar, so don't blame me for it. I try my best to do what is the right thing. But he used to always say that this, uh, the country works despite the government. 
<laughs> you know, he says, ye hamare desh ye chal raha hai. it's not because what Bharat Sarkar is doing, is despite Bharat Sarkar. Right. हिंदुस्तान चल भारत भाग्य विधाता हमारा सेक्पाल करता है इसके वह कम टू यू एंड सो आई एम शुरू यू वेंट विथ हिम टू टू स्वीडन एंड यू नो डिड यू सी नो नो इट वाज इन जिनीवा जिनीवा ओके जी वेलर इज लेटर ओके शी वाज इन जिनीवा ड्यूरिंग द ब्रुंटलैंड कमिशन राइट शी वाज वेरी As I told you, I was not directly. I was the environmentalist in the family. <laughs> She's an environmentalist. <laughs> no, no, sure. So I mean, that, she, that's fine. Let, we will come to what you know. Your, your. Uh, but what I'm trying to uh, understand from you is the evolution on uh, Professor Desai's uh, yeah. thinking and incorporation, and yeah. what impact yeah. did he okay. have? Yeah, I would say that basically the Brundtland Commission's the, con the conceptual work on sustainable development was is very much the work of a academic. If you read the piece that I wrote for Brundtland, yes, it is written in a more fluent style than an academic paper, because I had enough experience of convincing people who are not academics in the planning commission. That was perhaps one of my skills. But it is not the paper of an environmental activist. It's a paper which is always balancing this against that. No? It's not a paper, but, and it's trying to find common ground. As I said, it's a bridge. Whereas environment is one shore, development was the other shore. What we were trying to do to sustain well development is build a bridge, so that the two sides can talk and meet with each other. So in that sense, it was never something which it had to be written in a form which would be acceptable to both sides. On balance, I think I would say that because I wrote it, it has probably been more accepted by people who come from the development side. Whereas I think the people who are primarily environmentalists, conservationists, etc., have always looked at it with a little bit of suspicion, you know, saying that this is a trick, to you know, uh, type of thing. But it has changed because of the European, uh, and then it has acquired a certain status now as a. Uh, slogan and so on. So let's let's hear yeah. from Aditi on what what. No, uh, my questions. my perception of uh, uh, Nitin. I mean, one reason I even got interested in him was that his broad understanding of all the subjects and the linkages between these subjects and his job in the planning commission was project appraisal division, which handled all public sector projects above two crores of rupees. So and because he came there and he got stuck, and this was a period, actually early 70s, 72. I met him later in 77, um, when Bangladesh war had been won, and there was a euphoria that India can go places, etc., etc. And he left this job. Of course, Dr. Chakravarti was uh, instrumental in getting him here. But once he came here, people used to come for one year and go back. He could have gone back to Tata to his ten thousand rupee job. It was an exciting job also, but he didn't because he was fired. One thing internally by this thing, that we should do something for India. That this is a bigger palette, and that's where he wanted. He saw himself. He didn't see himself finally as going back to the university, whether in India or abroad, <coughs> or into. And he also didn't see himself as a typical government servant. So he remained a consultant for eight nine years. In fact, when I married him. I said, if you want to be in government, be in government. Otherwise, get out. So he actually applied for the same job that he had been doing for eight years, <clears throat> which is as a consultant, though he was at additional secretary level. So I think the perspective that he got by working deeply into various subjects, from atomic energy to fisheries to water to this, and then this commission on backward areas, tribal areas. That really, and in depth, in going into projects, fighting before the Public Investment Board whether this project should or should not be implemented, and these were the development projects of the Nairobian post, immediate post Nairobian area. So it was a big deal, and he used to tell me, if I can stop a bad project from being implemented, I think I've achieved quite a lot. I've always been a science buff. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm not trained as a scientist, I've always been a science buff. As she, she will tell you that I, one of my great ambitions was to write popular science for children, you know, <laughs> which I've never done. But I, it was my it was my hope. But I used to always read a lot of science, 
I had a lot of time for technologists and scientists. I'm one of the rare economists whom technologists consider respectable. Uh, and uh, the computerization uh, the but I was generally science oriented and so on. But I think basically it was increasingly clear that uh, when we were talking these issues of the interface between environment and development, it was not something which was had to be done. See, we were trying. We are moving beyond the Raja Maharaja uh, species, you know, big mammal preservation business. Uh, you have to go beyond that. I mean, the, 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 oh, Project Tiger is very important, but you know you can't look at the issue only in terms of Project Tiger, and uh, you have to look at it much more broadly. So I would say that that broadening, and I see this now happening more often. I have a friend who, when he made a lot of money in the uh, uh, and wanted to do some good, he said, "I want to do something for tigers." So he set up a trust and decided to give you know, jeeps and usual things to uh, rangers. Then he came to the conclusion, but you can't do this unless you protect forests. So he extended his uh, grants to forest protection. Is this Himendra Kotari? Yeah. Then Himendra and the th third, he says, you can't, you can't protect forests without looking at people who live around forests. And now he's giving money for education and health of people, villages who live around forests. Yeah. Now that is sustainability. That my concern may have started with tigers, but I realized that this is all part of a system. Yeah. That I can't do one thing without doing these other things. No, there's no point in saying I'm protecting tigers and say that I'm going to neglect the people who live on the edges of these protected areas. Right. No? So that is what sustainability in practice is.